First of all, in Hebrew, the concept of something being fulfilled. Because when the Bible talks about fulfilling something, generally speaking, especially Matthew 5, 17, which says, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, not to destroy them, but to fulfill. All right? Now, generally speaking, in Greek thought, um, people automatically, without even knowing the, the really English or the Greek, <laughs> but uh, to them, they've been taught that fulfill means to end. Okay? And, and, and so the, the, all these things had ended, which means that, that, that Yeshua's words in the book of, of Matijahu would be, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to destroy the law and the prophets. Okay? Uh, okay, which really doesn't make uh, much sense there as, as well. But the concept of fulfilling in Hebrew comes from the word malay. Malay. And we're going to spell it like this. Okay? Malay. Malay is um, is the Hebrew word that's generally translated into the Greek plurao, okay? which is translated into English as fulfill. Now remember, I'm going to suggest to you that the meaning of words all come from where? The beginning. And the very first occurrence that we have of a word that's translated as fulfilled, especially uh, fulfilled by the Ruach or fulfilling a feast. See, in Hebrew thought, you know, the people that wrote the Bible, they used the same word to describe filling up a glass with something as they do fulfilling a prophecy. It's the same word. It's the same concept. Because it's based upon concrete and natural things. And so, for example, when Yeshua comes to fulfill a prophecy, he comes to complete, complete it, to make it whole. And so, therefore... And I'll, I'll explain this by going back to the beginning. The first occurrence of Malay, remember we talked about the individual days of the week in which creation takes place. And at the end of those days, he tells us it is what? Good. It is tov. All right? Now, remember, each individual day cannot produce life. Right? Life is found in tov miod. Right? To put everything into it so it can produce life now. How did that happen? It happened by the Father taking something that has no life in it, the waters, and he fills the waters with the sea creatures. Are you with me? Malay. He fills it. Now it has what? Life. Remember, they just put fill, but it's the same word as fulfill. Same concept. And so, therefore, the same is true with the dirt, the same is true with the heavens. There's no life in the oxygen in the atmosphere. There's no life there. So he puts, he fills the heavens with what? The fowl. Now there's life in the heavens. There's no life in the dirt. All right. So, so, so he fills the dirt with the seeds and the, uh, and the roots and the herb bearing plants. And now it can produce life, not just life, but, uh, abundantly. So the first concepts of fulfilling in the Bible is putting life into something. To put the life into it. Remember, the very first occurrence is always. I say always. I haven't seen an exception yet. But that doesn't mean there isn't. Uh, is, is going to express the idea of something concrete. Something that you all can taste and touch and feel and smell and experience. And so, I'm going to go to the rabbis now. We're in. We're, how, many, how many of you? Raise your hand if you've ever been and seen an a, a, a Orthodox tour service in a synagogue. Mike, I know some of you guys have, but some of you have seen that. Okay, Trent, the rest of you. Um, when you go to synagogue, they will come up to the beach. Now, you're just going to have to pretend this is a, a tour scroll. Why? Because I don't have one with me. Okay, it's a, really, it's a really tough one. Okay, so let's imagine this Bible is a tour scroll. And so they will come up to the bima, and the tour scroll will be open. And what they'll do is, see, now I wish I didn't have a microphone in my hand, but they'll take a yad. This just became our yad. <laughs> okay. They can't take a yad and they go up and they read certain portions of the text. And they would take the yad and point to the individual word, uh, pointed or unpointed, and they would uh, read the text. Now, of course, they use, a, uh, they, they use this little yad for, because I, I, my contention to you that every commandment has a natural reason and a spiritual reason. Every commandment of God has a natural reason and a spiritual reason. God's not a God of ritual. Our Father, that, that's the Greek gods. Our Father's not sitting up in the heavens saying, okay, I'm going to have them put sacrifices on the altar. It doesn't, there's no meaning to it. There's no purpose of putting sacrifices on the altar. I just want to see if they're stupid enough to actually do it. 
I just want to see if my people are loyal enough to me that they'll actually stand on their head and spit snowballs if I tell them to. He's not, that's not the God that we're talking about. That's not the creator that we're talking about. There is a reason for every command. There's a natural reason for circumcision, and there's a spiritual reason for circumcision. One obviously points to the other. One comes first. What, what comes first? Natural, then the spiritual. And so the natural reason for putting this uh, on using a yacht is because when you're dealing with an ancient document, what do you not do? You don't touch it with your hands because your oils get on your hand and destroy the document. The spiritual reason, of course, is, 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 is the flesh defiling, you know, the text. And so they would point to it. Now, when, just like many congregations, when a man would come up to read from the Torah that had no relationship with the author of the Torah. I want you to listen carefully, please. If a man came up to read the Torah portion and he was just reading the words, the black letters on the white scroll, he had no relationship with the author. He's just going through the rote reading of it. In Hebrew, you know those people that wrote the Bible, that's called the letter of the law and it's called honoring God with your lips. Why? Because they would go and they would just read the letter of it. They'd read the black words on the white scroll and they're just saying it with their lips. Now, if a reader came up and he had a relationship with the author, the life was in it, and he has passionate belief in the author, now he reads the scroll. That's called the spirit of the law and called honoring him with your heart. Okay? So there's two different... Uh, motivations for coming up and reading the Torah scroll. Here's my point. In the scriptures, we are told, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that Paul talks about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Now, religious systems include that that means that the letter of the law was keeping the commandments and the spirit of the law is not keeping the commandments. I mean, that's that's fundamentally what's taught uh, in, 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 in most... Um, uh, churches today, the letter of the law, are those who are still keeping those old, uh, you know, uh, commandments. And the spirit of the law is doing things from the inside, not keeping commandments and so forth. But in, in Hebrew thought, the letter of the law is reading the law without relationship. The spirit of the law is reading it with relationship. See, a, that's a fundamental, important thing to see, that there's a difference between those two terms. And so, therefore, if you are just reading the Torah and there's no relationship, as opposed to reading the Torah with a relationship, here's my point. The letter of the law is no life in it. The spirit of the law is the life is in it. Now, Yeshua is speaking to the religious people of his time. Remember the Jews, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And he says, you are honoring me with your lips. Letter of the law, but your what is far from me? Your heart is far from me. He just told them, yeah, you're going up to the Bema seat. And of course, I know there's no religious people like that that just go to church and they just go through the rote thing and then they go back home. That never happens anywhere else, only with the Jews, huh? <laughs> but the reality is that is true. And so to, to, that's why he said, you're honoring me through your lips. What is he saying? Yeah, you go to the synagogue, you get up there, you read the portions, but your relationship, your heart is far from me. And so now when Yeshua says, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to put the life back into the law and prophets. Fulfill, male, I came to put the life back into it. Why? Because religious systems suck the life out of the Torah and turned it into rote commandments that people, you know, did without relationship and without life in it. All right, so uh, what was the original question? Um, Oh, the idea of being fulfilled. So for somebody to fulfill something means they completed it. They put the life into it. When Yeshua came and observed, he became the, he put his life into Passover. Yeshua fulfilled the Passover, meaning what? He ended it? No, he put his very life into it, Mike. He gave himself for Kepha's sake, okay? Gave himself and put his whole life into it. And, and the same is true with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's why we say that there's still, some people say there's three, still three feasts that are unfulfilled. Yom Kippurim, uh, and um, uh, Yom Tura, Yom Kippurim, and of course Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. He will come and he will put his life into those as well. So that's the whole idea of something being fulfilled in the first place. Because some people would say, well, do we no longer do that because that was fulfilled in the Ruach? Okay, 
I, I'm okay with the statement, but what that, what's that got to do with the actual really doing it has been done away with? Because a lot of people use doing something in the spirit, which actually rea- in reality means we don't do anything at all. For most people to do something in the spirit means, well, we don't do anything at all anymore. And we just say we're doing it in the spirit. You know, I come, I, because I play in bands a lot. And I'm up on doing it because some people let me sit in with the band like you all so graciously uh, let me do. And you can go out there and you can see people that worshiping. Okay, you look out and here's what else you see. And you ask, aren't you worshiping? I'm worshiping in the spirit. They don't look any different than when they're washing dishes or, uh, you know, or letting out the cat. You know, uh, <laughs> Uh, so generally speaking, to, 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 to cop out and put something in, uh, in the spirit, all right, basically means, well, I don't have to basically do anything now. <laughs> uh, okay, never mind. I'm getting a little sarcastic. Okay, let's move on. Um, once again, the whole idea of the seat seat is something in the natural that reminds you of something uh, far deeper from, uh, than that. Um, and once again, keeping in, in mind that the whole idea of this is out of love and devotion in the first place. If you're wearing CC just for the sake of doing them, then you are going by the letter of the law and you're just honoring God with your pants. <laughs> <Something. laughs> okay, that was stupid, but I'm full of stupid things. Okay. Um, so uh, that's the whole idea of doing things, is keeping Sabbath a weightier matter of the law. Well, I think I kind of addressed that earlier. Now, if I said that out of context of Matthew chapter 23, then I'd be stoned before I leave here. I think think you all would take me out in the parking lot. I'm pretty sure you would. Um, But in context of the use of the word weightier matter of the Torah, no. I mean, that's read Matthew chapter 23. That's the occurrence of the phrase. Now, if you want to say something else, is, is, is Sabbath probably the mo- one of the most precious things to our God and our King? Yes, absolutely. But if you want to use it in context of a weightier matter of the Torah, no, it's not. It says mercy, justice, and, and, and faith. Those, those are the weightier matters of the Torah. Um, and so just strictly answering that, um, I don't know what this says. We'll have to get to it. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I may be guilty of this already. If a teaching offends someone, should we not teach it so we do not offend anyone? Well, I, 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 that's, that's a general statement that I would probably agree with, but it, be ten, it, be ten, it depends on what it is. There's some things, you know, truth hurts, gang. <laughs> okay? There's just some things that whether it's going to offend anybody or not, we have to take a stand for. And there's some things where we can use a little common sense and back off. And we don't make mountains out of some molehills, if you will. And so that, that, I would answer that by saying it depends on what, uh, the teaching is. Um, I know that sometimes we have a tendency to say, well, that's not a salvational issue. Uh, and while that statement alone may be true, uh, sometimes, um, in traditional Western religious systems, for example, that's the only issue there is. Just get them saved. You know, doesn't matter what they do, how they treat the Father, what they say, how they act from that point forward, because all those are not salvational issues. Well, that's a cop-out to me, okay? So I would not agree with that. I know I'm offending somebody by saying this, and because you always do, all right? But there are some things that um, that we we need to be firmly convinced, and it should be a conviction for us, and we stand for those convictions. But I'm going to suggest to you that there are some things uh, that um, <laughs> and we're putting the cart before the horse in a lot of in, in a lot of things. So to cop out and say a salvational issue, um, there I, I I I can tell you uh, that uh, there are uh, particularly Christian commentaries out there. Uh, I, I have two uh, that particularly come to mind right now. I have one on one side that's written by a Baptist and the other one that's written by a Pentecostal. You probably already know where I'm going with this, all right? And both of them say exactly the same thing. See, when someone tells me it's this way or no way, and they're very dogmatic about it, that usually tells me they haven't read enough. Because the old saying is true, the more I know, 
the more I know I don't know. And that is, I've lived by that axiom because I've seen it happen in my own life. The more I know, the more I don't, I don't know. When someone says I know, that means they don't know. Did that make any sense to you? Explain it. Okay, all right. Okay. And so we need to be very careful about these things. So, so I, because the more I learned, the more I realized uh, about how dogmatic I was about this in thinking. Because some people will say, well, you know, when we came to this conclusion, we strictly went by what the Bible says, implying that everybody else used Marvel comic books to come to their understanding. I, I'm not sure what it, people mean when they say something like that. We use the Bible for our proof. As if to say nobody else did but us. We finally discovered the Bible. Okay. Uh, that's just me though. That's just funny things that, 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 that people say. You know, it's like funny things like, uh, uh, you go to the convenience store, for example, and inevitably I'll take my coffee and I'll go up to the counter and inevitably the clerk will say, is that everything? And I go, it's just a cup of coffee. I can't afford everything. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm only bringing out the fact. <laughs> I'm just bringing out the fact that in our language, we have some funny things uh, that sometimes don't even make a lick of sense uh, that they would say that. Okay. Oh, isn't it interesting what the next one is? Oh, these are all with the same pen. <laughs> oh, it's a continuation. I'm sorry. I think if the law is not a salvation issue, why keep it? Hmm. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit yesterday about the concept of the principle of the seed and the fact that the Bible tells us that the seed is the what? Word of God. And that when you're out in a field, before any fruit can be produced, you have to plant the seed. So that's your salvation issue. Father does the work. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the farmer, the husbandman. No, I'm not going to do it. Okay. The fa- but, but the father is the farmer. It's him that plants the seed, right? Um, into the field. And so the father always does the work you can't do. Once again, you can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. So the father has to do that for you. That's the salvation issue. You can't save yourself. Salvation is in him and him only. And it's always been that way. But the Bible also says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, that the seed is in the what? Fruit. So if you don't produce the fruit and that was the seed is, then it dies right there. Are you with me? So if using, using the terminology that Yeshua uses, because he's always talking about farming. No man uh, uh, puts his hand to the plow and, and, and turns back. He knew a lot about farming. As a matter of fact, that, that question I told you I wasn't going to talk about is why I believe that Yeshua was a farmer, not a carpenter. Okay. <laughs> So I got it out there. Okay. All right. And we don't, we don't have time to go into that, but, uh, for some reason, people are actually teaching according to a field. Some, I'm, I'm not condemning the person that wrote this. I'm assuming this is an honest question that they're asked. Uh, but according to modern theology, we're supposed to go out and plant the seed and then that's it. And we don't produce any fruit. We just plant the seed. As soon as the seed's over with, remember the great commission is not to win souls for, for, for Jesus. The Great Commission is to go ye therefore and what? Teach all nations whatsoever I have commanded you. So that's the Great Commission. So the idea of the salvation issue is something only our Father can do. He starts it. Now that we have His seat in us, which means we have His genetic information, only now can we produce His fruit. But see, it's not church fruit... <laughs> It's not Gentile fruit. It's not Christian fruit. The Word of God is from the beginning and with God, and God was the Word. Now that you have His information, and now you can produce the fruit, because that's where the seed is. Okay? I'm not going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. Okay, this is a very good question, especially what I said earlier. Is your salvation hinged on worrying seed seed or doing feasts? Absolutely not. I think we've covered that about 912 times, okay? Uh, keeping, keeping the commandments is not how you get into the kingdom. Why? Because Paul makes it very clear. Nobody keeps the commandments. I remember one time. I remember one time I was in Berk, uh, not Berkeley, Bakersfield, California. And I was <laughs> back to that again. And, and I was uh, doing a lecture in a great big uh, auditorium. 
And uh, I remember I was talking about a series called The Earth is Filled with Violence. And the, all of a sudden, this guy jumps up out of the audience, doesn't raise his hand, doesn't say, excuse me, whatever. He just jumps up. And this is exactly the way he said it to me. He says, so you keep all 613 commandments? I said, no, I don't have a menstrual cycle. Okay. Now, of course, the whole place went into hysterics, okay, and totally embarrassed the man. That man was totally embarrassed because I guarantee you they weren't laughing with the man. Okay. And I really felt sorry for the guy because I didn't want to. Some of you know me. I don't have that kind of heart. I'm not here to do that. Um, and so I said, sir, would you please talk to me after this session? And he was a kind enough and only man to talk to me after the session. I said, the reason um, why I said that, I said, first of all, I want to apologize because that was a knee-jerk reaction. And, I, and, and that was coming from my emotion rather than stopping and, and, and answering the question. And I said, but the reason why I said that is because I'd be willing to bet that you were raised in a church atmosphere just like I was. And when someone says they keep all the commandments of God, you th- or they keep the commandments of God, you're thinking they keep all 613 commandments. And so naturally, you think of one they know they don't keep, and then he got you. Okay, so you stone your rebellious son for eating broccoli or for not eating his broccoli in, a, in this high chair, whatever, you know. And they automatically start trying to think of commandments that they know you can't keep so they can go, I got you. I said, but the reality is that concept of keep in Hebrew is shamar. The root is shamar. Shem, mem, resh. Looks like this. I generally write all Hebrew words in their call send, their, their simple stem. Shamar. Shamar means to guard, to watch, to protect. So when the Bible says keep, keep the commandments or observe the commandments, sometimes it's translated as observe, it's saying guard, watch, and protect them. Where does that come from? Guess what? The garden. Because Adam is told to keep the garden, to work the soil, and to keep the garden. What Adam was told is watch, Guard and protect the garden. So what happens if you're watching and guarding and protecting, you don't let a serpent come into the garden. So I'm going to suggest to you that the whole sin problem does not stem from something Adam did that he shouldn't have done because that's what all religious systems do. They're all looking for that little thing called original sin. And everybody has a different idea. Well, it was this, or it was that. You know, it was sex. It was eating an apple. You know, it was all these kind of things. When in reality, the whole thing starts with something Adam didn't do that he was supposed to do. Do you see it? That's what started things. It wasn't something he did. And the reason why I think that's important, because if we pass that concept down from generation to generation, that every time something goes wrong, it's something somebody did. Human nature kicks in and everybody says, I didn't do anything. And that's the reason why we ha- don't have a lot of forgiveness between brothers and sisters and, and friends and pastors and congregates because when something goes wrong, neither side, because their human nature kicks in, neither, you go to each I've, I don't know how many people I've counseled over the years, even, even from, from being a reg- regular pastor, dude, and you bring the two problems, especially if it's a husband and wife, but you bring the two people that are having the problem and both of them insist they didn't do anything wrong. And you can't get reconciliation. None of them stop to think, Maybe it's something I didn't do that I should have done because that's how all sin starts. That's how the, remember, Eve was deceived. It was Adam that transgressed. How did he transgress? By doing something he shouldn't have done? No, by not doing something he should have done. He was supposed to guard and protect the garden. I'm going to suggest to you it was not a snake that was in the garden. It was not a serpent that was guarded. First of all, let me give you two reasons. Uh, number one, um, the word nachash in itself, etymologically, speaks of something shiny, bright, attractive. So in its etymological root, it's something that would be a shiny or bright, brassy kind of a thing. And, and as a matter of fact, the word brass also comes from the same root because it's shiny and attracts your attention. As a matter of fact, they would use it for mirrors uh, in, in those days. So the root of it means something bright and shiny, attractive, which perfectly matches second Corinthians chapter 11. Even so the enemy, or it's not that we, uh, Satan would be transformed as an angel of light. 